Welcome to the Everyone's a Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast. Hey, yeah, Man. that is the name of the show. I'm trying to do two things at once. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, I'm your co-host, Bob Zero. With me, as always, is professional film critic, Sean Patrick. We're at IHateCritics.net, Everyone's a Critic Podcast.com, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Critics Pod. It's our handle. Friend us there, like us. Uh, participate in the conversation. We usually post our trailers and r- Sean's reviews and some other fun things, like Quentin Tarantino saying Rob Zombie's Halloween is good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, I won't do it. I won't do it. Could, what else, you posted something towards... <laughs> Was it the Star Wars meme you posted that you asked if I wrote it? <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, I mean, so we try to be entertaining on social media as we best, best we can. Yeah. Uh, we also are on YouTube, so like us there, subscribe, do the thumbs up and all that good stuff. If you want to listen to it there. What am I forgetting? Patreon, I hate critics, done that slash Patreon. Best way to help support the podcast. And then our podcast merch tab at I hate critics dot net. Uh, work like if, I've actually been messaging with Jeff all weekend long, so hopefully we'll get something in the works for next year. A couple of cool designs, and maybe uh, I don't know. We'll see if we're still with T Public or not. But uh, and if the licensing still will take care if Batman is on a shirt or <laughs> Cameron Diaz or Willem Dafoe or <laughs> I think Jesus is uh, public domain, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, let's start with our trailer. It's Guy Ritchie's The Gentleman. Yeah, this is a weird one. I don't really know what to make of this. I think uh, watching this trailer, there's an all-star cast, of course, with uh, Matthew McConaughey as a drunk dealer, but he's in England for some reason, even though he's an American. He's up against Henry Golding, uh, who's a younger drug dealer. Charlie Hunnam is in there somewhere. I think he works for McConaughey from the previous trailer, though you can't really tell much from this trailer. I think Charlie Hunnam is dead in this trailer <laughs> at some point, but I'm not sure, which would be kind of a pretty big spoiler to put in the trailer. I don't know. I'm not a not loving this trailer. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm i not a huge Guy Ritchie fan. I don't think you are either. And I know he has his audience, especially in his earlier stuff. And this one looks like it could be more up that alley. It's got a good cast. Charlie Hunnam looks like he's having fun if nothing else, and so does Matthew McConaughey, and they all do, and (laughs) hopefully that, if that translates on screen, then that's really all you can ask for in a movie like this. That said, it's January, I really rarely ever have any good feelings about anything that comes out in January. Right. And Guy Ritchie hasn't been the most, uh, you know, consistent guy in the world. (laughs) You really can't tell what he's doing. He did did Aladdin last year, like, what, what was that about? Yeah, so there's Last year, that. This year, whatever it is. We're in, it's kind of a transition period. <laughs> uh, and the two new movies this week are going to be part- talked about in our year in review, so we'll just kind of do it then. Uh, did you want to talk about A Hidden Life at all? Or? I can, because uh, it, it's one of my honorable mentions. I wanted to put it on the list, but edged out by a couple of other things. Uh, a Hidden Life, of course, is Terrence Malick, which uh, I know Bob will never watch. Well, it, uh, <laughs> if it's got a narrative, I will. It's, it does. Uh, and it looked like from the trailer, this one might. It's incredible. Uh, it's uh, it's classically Terrence Malick. It's got uh, a fascinating story about a man named Franz who uh, initially does go to World War II. He sees the horrors that are being committed. He senses that uh, what Hitler is doing is wrong, and uh, especially he feels that in the eyes of God, he could never swear allegiance to Hitler. And in that way, he, once he gets sent back home uh, to his farm, he decides that he won't go back to the war if called. And this is a huge thing. It affects him, it affects his family, it affects his village. Everybody's affected by this decision. Because all these people that he knows are the ones who have to judge him and kind of decide what, you know, what to do with this guy who's not going to go along with what everybody else is going along with. Uh, eventually, they do call him up, and the decision has to be made as to what they're going to do with him. And the fascinating thing here is, is, is the central question of what would you do in this situation. He could very easily – he has an out. He could compromise, just make it – you know. Um, swear, lo- swear loyalty to Hitler, but don't fight in the war. He could go work in a hospital and just never have to go into the war and, and fight on the, behalf of this country. But he, that would be a lie. That would be a lie to him. It would be a lie to God. And you know, if, you, if somebody asks you, 
your life or swearing allegiance to Hitler, what do you do? Right. And that is a big question. But also the other thing that, that he Malik does so brilliantly here is using Franz and his wife as these mirrors to the rest of society. Because anytime anybody else looks at Franz, they're seeing the thing that they've done, the compromise that they've made, and they feel this incredible shame. At the same time, you know, they're yelling and they're screaming and they're doing their best to try and justify the decision that they've made to save their lives and to have it a little bit easier than the rest of the than the rest of the country. <laughs> right. Every time they see him and they see him resisting and they see him not willing to pledge allegiance to Hitler, it reflects what they've done and they feel that shame and they communicate that shame through their anger and through these looks and glances and just this the inability to look at him because they feel sh- ashamed of themselves when they look at him. They try and mask it by pretending that they're angry with him, but really what they're angry at is themselves and the willingness that they've, they've shown to compromise in this situation. That's a really incredible way to, to build a drama. I mean, it sounds like something I'd like, and I, it's not that I don't like Terrence Malick. I just really don't like Tree of Life, and that's... <laughs> And the other one after that, the ballet or whatever we called it, or you called it. <laughs> to the Wonder. It was, I don't know, it's just too weird for me or too eye-rolling or whatever. <clears throat> but this st- sounds good, so I, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing it. I mean, just that, like you said, especially today, I mean, Swearing Allegiance Den's probably not as hard, you know, because you're in it, you know. Yeah. If you were to put a gun in my head and make me swear to Trump, I you know I'm just gonna whatever to get out of it. I don't, <laughs> but if he ends up being Hitler in 30 years, you know that's what we look back at this as, and it's very entirely possible. But that's the beauty of him coming out today, this era. So that's what is really uh, cool about it. And it it's a neat idea, and I, I'm kind of looking forward to seeing that, or at least giving it a shot. It's one of the better movies of the year for sure. It's a, I think it's another. I probably want to see it again before I. It's not in my top 10. It could have been in my top 10. It could be in the top five, for that matter. I just I, It's so fresh that I left it off the list. Fair enough. Uh, what do you want to say about this year? It's kind of a interesting year. You know, you look at the top 50 movies and just a small handful of original ideas. But you look at our top tens, and I don't know how many, you know, unless a book counts. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think I have one that could be considered or that is a existing IP. Otherwise I'm sure yours is probably very yeah. similar. Yeah. One really one existing IP, uh, uh, a movie that's based on real life. Right. Um, that's other than that. Yeah. It's so, I mean, I don't, I, I, based on the top 50, I'd say it's kind of a poor year, but based on the great movies, I'd say it's a great year. I don't there know. Been, yeah. I mean, I've got a list that's over nearly 30 movies long in terms of, Movies that I could have put on my top ten list that I would be okay actually having there. Um, I think the thing that the thing that though that that does stand out and will stand out because it is the dominant theme of the year is the microwave movies. These reheated nostalgia fests that uh, I by the end of the year broke me. <laughs> Star Wars broke me. Terminator broke me. Uh, Zombieland broke me. All those you know, just that reheated. Uh, microwave movies. They, they just took the same thing that we've enjoyed before and put it in the microwave, heated it up again, and served it back. And I'm just, I'm done. I'm just so tired. Uh, and that's, I think that ref, that's definitely reflected in the movies I liked this year, where, you know, it's like a limited number of sequels. Uh, very, very limited. I think just two, there are two sequels on my list. Three, if you count the entirety of the Marvel Universe. I've got one Marvel movie that I really liked this year. Um, <clears throat> Beyond that, you know, it's a lot of, a lot more interesting and daring and unique stuff. And uh, I'm, 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 I'm happy with this year, and I'm, I'm desperately annoyed with this year because I have to see so much of that stuff. Right. With my job, and I can't just watch <laughs> this stuff. Right, but I think with the, you know, we are making moves on the podcast. Like we're not talking about what's that silly c- cartoon movie? Spies in disguise. I mean, what are we gonna? do on you know there's nothing we can really add to something like that so we're trying to make it as keep ourselves entertained too i'm excited about next week already (laughs) yeah uh but this should be fun uh do we just start with number 10 and then kind of do our honorable mentions after the fact that's fine want me to go first or you want to go first you start all right 
I, honest to God, my list could really be broke up into three sections. Number one stands alone. Two through six are like, you know, every day it's going to be a different. They're going to, they're that good, close to each other that I like them almost equally. And then seven through nine, you know, the next level down, the same way. I put number 10 as Joker. I don't feel great about it. But at the same time, when we did their, when it came out, I mean, I, I liked it when I saw it. It really did move me in the theater. I, you know, it caused for a good discussion on the podcast. Uh, but at the same time, I'm annoyed by the fact that this is a movie that people are grabbing on for Oscars and awards and stuff. And, you know, as much as I like it, it's not as good as everybody's saying it is. And I could easily have moved 15 movies and put it here. Yeah. I'm just picking the Joker because I did like it a lot at the time and it was high on my list when we did the top 100 of all time, even though we had just seen it that week. So it was fresh in our, especially me and Josh's mind. Yeah. Uh, but I do feel obligated to leave there. So it's the one IP that I have in my top 10 as far as existing IP, as far as I know, unless right. I'm missing something. I wonder, I, I wonder if Josh were here, if that would be his number one. I'm wondering too. He was that, It'd be a lot. My brothers, was, for sure. He was that effusive about it. He really loved it. I, I was, uh, I don't hate it. I think it's impressive in many ways, but I, I, it's not even one of my honorable mentions I for the year. I think me and you, like, I think we agree on it, but I like what something, you know, about what it is, and you right. don't like what it does. Yeah. So it's kind of a, it's just a difference of opinion, really. Yeah. Like I said, I found it to be just any kind of movie that you want it to be. You can, you can apply whatever you want to Joker, and, and it will be that because that's what you want to see in it. And that doesn't do anything for me. Uh, my number 10 is Little Women. Uh, Greta Gerwig uh, directing uh, Louisa May Alcott's legendary story. This is the, uh, I guess, the existing IP on my list. Oh, yeah. I suppose <laughs> I have two existing IPs now that you uh, say that. <laughs> I love this film so much. This is so incredibly moving. And uh, you'd think to yourself that you maybe don't need another, another version of Little Women. But uh, the way she frames it, the artistry that she brings to it, you know, the story is familiar, but the way she shoots it is so unique and different. And I, I love the time shifts and especially the way that it works with Amy, the character played by Florence Pugh, who had the best year of any actress ever. <laughs> we'll get to yes. that. But uh, she was also in Fighting With My Family, yes. which is really good. Yes. Uh, at least her performance was. Right. And uh, I, what, the way he, she takes her from the age of 12 to the age of 22 in this movie, I think it is, Something in that range, and she does so by forced perspective, and by just the, moderate mod, moderating the way that Florence Pugh dresses and uses her voice, and the way she's framed against other actors. So she can you can see her as as smaller and more energetic, or you can see her as older and a little bit more haunted as a twenty year old. And I thought that was really incredible the way that she played that because it's much easier uh, to age down Saoirse Ronan or or. Uh, I always forget Emma Watson. Emma Watson. They they their their characters are a little bit older, so it's a little bit easier to work with them in that age range. You don't need to necessarily see much of a difference in them, but you definitely see the difference in between what Florence Pugh is doing. And I thought the artistry that Greta Gerberg brought to that, the where it doesn't become an issue. It's not something you're tend to focus on until afterwards when you're looking at kind of like you're examining it the way I do, taking it apart and putting it back together again. I was so impressed by the way they handled that. I was impressed by everything in this movie. It's just wonderfully told story, and like you know, this is such a great story to begin with, and she brings so much life and vitality to it. It's kind of a shame that because I don't think either one of us were all that excited when the trailer came out, even though it's got Cersei Ronan, who's never disappointed, <laughs> right. Florence Pugh, who we've you know been praising all year long, and Emma Watson's always solid, and then Greta Gerwig directed it, and that was <laughs> you know Lady Bird was in our top five, I think, last year, if I'm not mistaken. So it's. It, I mean, it was just kind of one of the... Even when I went to see it, I wasn't really looking forward to it. And when I was doing my top tens, I kept putting it ahead of movies. I'm like, no, I can't put Little Women ahead. Even that's how much I liked it. I mean, I had it as an honorable mention, but I feel like I was... It's just so hard to say what's better than what. Uh, and I mean, we definitely have to recognize the futility and silliness of, of doing this, but it's, you know, <laughs> it's a good framing device for a year. Right. 
But no, it's a fantastic movie. And, uh, you know, if guys, if your girlfriend drives you, you know, makes you go see this, you're going to enjoy it. I mean, it's yeah. that. It's That's that one of the good. weird controversies that has uh, kind of come up around this movie. It's one of those things where you wonder if this is what the uh, the Oscar controversy is going to be this year is that people are saying things like men are ignoring little women. And well, yeah, ignoring a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, this it, this is not anything anything that he would would be surprised about. That's to, to your it's your fault if you're ignoring this if you're missing out on this. It's not necessarily some kind of culture wide conspiracy. Yeah. So you know, to those saying that, you know, good movies that don't exist. You know, that we got like you said, thirty of them that could easily be top ten movies. By the way, just to you know, kind of toot my own horn, I've got three female directors on my list. Just saying. I have no idea what I got. <laughs> Maybe just one. Uh, but I think it's my next one. So, uh, female director. I really like the hu- the Hustlers. Uh, I I think that's a fantastic movie. Uh, that you know, it's pretty straightforward. But I, you know, I like the story. I think Jennifer Lopez is fantastic in it, and I. You know, you make a movie about strippers and have it not be, you know, it's, I don't know, it's not a pervy movie. You know, it's sexy when it wants to be, but it's very, it's just a, I don't know, I really like the story. I like, I like how it pisses me off. I like how invested I get into it. I, I just, I really think it's very, very good. And I don't know if I'm just forcing it to, you know, onto my list. Yeah. Uh, But I just, it's. Maybe it could be higher, maybe it could be lower, but I it's the one I don't know, it just really surprised me how good it was when I saw it in the theater. Yeah, Lorraine Scafari is the director there and she's a she does an amazing job. It's one of my honorable mentions this year and uh effortlessly sexy and really uh skirts that line very well between creepy and sexy because obviously, you know, that that uh scenario can be very uh obviously and it's a rather creepy scenario in some right. ways. So you have to you have the creepiness. There. But the introduction of Jennifer Lopez in this movie is, I mean, it's the sexiest moment of the year by far. And it, she intends it that way. She owns it. It belongs to her. That is the intention that she's put forward here is to make this the sexiest thing you've seen this year. Because right. it's part of her job. And, and not to cut you off, but that's where you introduce to her, where you right. leave her is the polar opposite of where she is and i don't know just that transformation to you know arguably one of the sexiest women alive to just a regular person you know they, they do such a good job of showing her at both ends of the spectrum in this movie and yeah big big arc uh well well portrayed and constance Wu, uh the perfect foil for her in that and i, I like where they both are at the end of the movie yeah uh, it seems earned that way I did, you know, I have had to deal with people, a couple right wingers saying they only went, to, they didn't even go to jail. I mean, what did they do to those poor men? I'm like, those poor <laughs> men. I think you missed the point of the movie. Yeah, no doubt. And then they're talking about times where their friends have been, they were in Vegas, and all of a sudden their credit card was ran for ten thousand dollars. And I'm like, okay, never mind. Wah wah wah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Buy her, beware. Right. <laughs> So maybe that's also pushing this movie a little further up to my. But I just I don't know I I just that's, I like, that's it. the it's in the trailer and it's one of the one of the funnier moments in the movie where they got a cop going. What are we going to do? Arrest him for giving him a good time? Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you got for number nine? My number nine is Us. Yes, this movie stuck with me all year long. Uh, Jordan Peele. I, honestly, this one keeps growing in my mind. It keeps getting uh, more uh, fascinating and scary uh, and, and just kind of reinvented in my head. The images in this movie, the scene of them sitting across from their doppelgangers, that, the murder in the eyes of Winston Duke's character, the, the, menace in the that menacing look that the daughter gives, the little boy with the mask, it's just all so incredibly creepy. And the way that Lupita Nyong'o creates these two very real characters, <laughs> these two very real characters and two distinct characters in the movie. It's just phenomenal. I mean, what a piece of acting and what an amazing piece of direction to uh, to create those two characters within one actor. And it just, you know, it's one of the best performances of the year. It's completely oh, forgotten yeah. and deserves to be brought back up to uh, talk about 
the best actress nominations because Lupita Nyong'o is incredible in this movie. Everybody is, but she really stands out. The violence is so impactful and so terrifying. Uh, the the scene where Tim Heidecker and Elizabeth Moss are murdered is gruesome yeah. and horrifying, and and I really couldn't get enough of that. I was uh, <laughs> it was amazing to watch. It's just one of those uh, just trying to crawl through the back of this the chair kind of scenes. Yeah, the music, the way they use the music was oh, phenomenal. Oh fuck yeah! It is. It's one of those movies. If you go back and listen to the episode where we talked about it. You can hear me trying to pull the strings on it, and this is literally a movie that I mean, Jordan Peele basically made a movie where humans can chase their own tail because that <laughs> you can keep because of who she is, and you know it. There really is a lot of there's no figuring it out because I mean, you know, I don't know. It's who are, you know who's good, who's bad, and it just it, it's hard to you can't really come to an ending. It's like the anti Joker where you can whatever you want. This one. There's no answer. It's just kind of, you know, it's you go along for the ride. And I just, I have it as an honorable mention, largely probably because it's been so long and that I've seen it. I've seen it twice this year, though. Uh, but uh, and you're right about Lupina Nyong'o, one of the best performances of the year, if not the yeah. best. Uh, loved us. Uh, yeah, go back and listen to that episode too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, number eight, largely because I doubt it's on your list. As I and I. The Irishman. I mean, I watched it twice. It's Scorsese. I, it's kind of a safe choice, uh, but it's good. You know, it, it's it's a really good movie. I like that it's more, and it's not just a violent movie. I love what they do with age, not the t- technology stuff, but you know, really as Joe Pesci and De Niro get older and seeing them at the very end of the movie, just you know how you know, these powerful men all of a sudden they're just these pathetic guys in wheelchairs. It's I don't know that whole the whole way he deals with aging. I I I just really I dug it. It was I love Scorsese, and this is probably the best thing he's done in ten years, if not longer. Uh, probably since it departed, maybe I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and I just again could have moved us or Little Women above it. I just I feel like I really wanted to represent it on the show because I do think it's a great movie, and it's. You know, it went to Netflix, and that's part of you know that's part of the change in how we're going to be seeing things going forward. It's an impressive film. Uh, I didn't put it on my list, uh, but I I just the me I can't I know I know what he's going for. I like I like the technical aspects of it. I love the filmmaking. I love the ideas that he that he's uh, searching for within this. Really interesting stuff, but. I just can't get past the length and the, the, and a certain amount of repetitiveness to to it within the length that just uh, really took me out of the movie. And uh, you know, I, I had hard. I'd see when I first saw it in New York, uh, I or in Los LA, Angeles yeah. when I went to Los Angeles, I, I I was jet lagged and I wasn't really able to pay much attention. And when I went back to it, I still struggled to, to stay interested in it. I was I was kind of forcing myself to stick with it, and it just never kind of connected with me overall. Yeah, I it's I don't know. It's one of those I don't necessarily have to watch beginning to end. I can just kind of come midway through or start it and pick it up later on. It's just it's kind of comfort food. It's definitely it's got that great Scorsese feel to it. Uh, but you're right. It is. It's hard to just sit and watch in one sitting. But I just kind of like being in that environment when I'm. You know, it's an old environment we grew up on, kind of in a way. But it was nice for it to come back in 2019. What do you got? <laughs> my number eight is my biggest reach. It's one that uh, not many people, well, very few people have seen or heard of. It's a little movie called Daddy Issues, and it's by a director named Amara Cash. And this movie is a very unique love story about a girl who falls in love with this girl she sees on Instagram. And she begins to kind of build this idea of who this woman is. She's like kind of a an influencer type on inf- Instagram. And this girl becomes obsessed with her. And she kind of tr- tries to figure out how to inf- 
insert herself into this girl's life. And eventually she does, and they t- the two begin this sort of romance. But uh, the Instagram girl, she has this whole other life where she's just kind of barely hanging on. She gives off this vibe of being this big-time influencer on Instagram, but in her real life, she's actually something of a sex worker, and she's working for this mostly for this uh, doctor who's a, a drug addict and has this very specific fetish that this girl lives into. And there's a twist in the middle of this movie that a lot of people can't deal with. And a lot of people dismiss this movie because of the twist. And I found it just to be <laughs> the most shocking and incredible digressive choice, or, I'm sorry, uh, uh, transgressive choice that you could possibly make in that moment. And I really loved it. I just, this movie is so stylish and unique. And the, the uh, especially the young girl uh, who, the, uh, her name escapes me now, but uh, the she's just such a wonderful young actress, she, the, and she's she's her coming of age in this, and the 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 horror and shock and disappointment she feels once the twist is revealed is just incredibly compelling, and she's very sympathetic, and I just love this movie. I wish more people would give this movie an opportunity. It's a very low budget film, no no movie stars in it at all, but I think Amara Cash is a director we're going to be seeing a lot more from. Yeah, I have not had a chance to see it yet, but it sounds good. I mean, at one point it was your first or second movie. Yeah, of the it year. was number one for a long time. Uh, number seven again, more comfort food for me. Once upon a time in Hollywood. It's my number seven as well. Really? <laughs> I mean, it, I, I could see. I see why people like it the best. I see why people. Uh, it's. It's hard to put Tarantino in a ranking. He just kind of exists in his own world. And I don't know. It's just it's comfort food. It's fun to watch. I love watching all of his characters talk. I just like watching Margot Robbie be there. You know, the way they use her. I like the way Brad Pitt talks. I like the way Leonardo, Leonardo DiCaprio doubts himself. And the way I, I just the whole thing is fun. It's funny. Uh, it's quintessential Tarantino, you know, and yeah. we haven't seen this. This is one of his better ones in recent memory, too, I think. If I remember right, when we did it, we had it pretty high on yeah. the list. Uh, you know, Kill Bills and Pulp Fiction, you know, maybe Inglorious Bastards. Uh, I don't know what else. It's kind of, this is one of the better ones he's ever done. And I. Yeah, this movie is just really exciting. <laughs> it's really. And you talked about Margot Robbie there. She. As much as people criticize how seemingly small her her role is, she's playing Sharon Tate. She is so necessary to how this movie plays out because, oh my God, it's Sharon Tate. We all know what happened to Sharon Tate. What is going to happen here? Because we've also seen Inglorious Bastards, and and we know that uh, you know this is Tarantino has a way of reaching through time and kind of uh, taking things in his own hands and. The way he does that here is so shocking and exciting and weird and darkly funny that it it just, the way he uses her to set you up for that is ingenious. Mm -hmm. And I just, I adore it. I really do. It's so fantastic. And there's just so many of those wonderfully classic uh, Quentin Tarantino touches throughout this movie. There's just those little little Tarantinoisms that work, like just a, a brief cameo appearance by uh, an actor playing uh, Steve McQueen. Uh, <laughs> just that, that wonderful little tiny scene is so ingenious. It just works. And then you've got the little girl on the set talking to Tarant- uh, talking to, Qu- ta- talking to DiCaprio and, and the, talking about process and acting. And she's just so magnetic. You can't take your eyes off of her. And, and the tears in his eyes when she tells him how great he was in the scene. It's just, it is so funny. It's so funny, but at the same time, it has impact because you've been sitting with this character for that long. And then, you know, the scene where Brad Pitt's, you know, fixing the antenna and just has a flashback memory of why he's out of work. Yeah. <laughs> or one of the reasons why he's out of work. Uh, just And then going into that, the ending, where... You know, we've seen Inglorious Bastards, but at the same time, they've been calling it the Charlie Manson movie. Right. <laughs> and so all of a sudden, it's just like, I don't know that I want to see this anymore. <laughs> and then they go the direction they do, and you're glad they do go that way. <laughs> but it, it's just, it, I'm, I'm calling it comfort food. It's Tarantino. And I, I, where do you rank a Tarantino movie? I mean, it's just, that's why 
It's here because I don't know where else yeah. to put it. <laughs> uh, I guess we'll go to number six, Uncut Gems for me. Uh, like I said, two through six are kind of all the same. And I'm sure it's higher on yours. I, this movie came out this week. It is just relentless. Uh, Adam Sandler, better than he's ever been, including uh, the whatever the PTA movie, Punch Drunk Love. Uh, just phenomenal. I mean, it's just you. Kevin Garnett's great in this movie. Uh, it, it's you, it makes you wonder. Want him to just keep doing movies like this? Because I don't even know what to say about this movie. It, you just it's one thing after another, and it's just exhausting. I'll uh, get to my thoughts on it a little bit because it's a, a a lot higher on my <laughs> list. I will say. Uh, my number six is A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, the uh, Mr. Rogers movie, as the pe- most people call it. Uh, with the M- Mr. Rogers movie that's not really about Mr. Rogers, which I love. Uh, Tom Hanks playing the role of Mr. Rogers and getting all the attention here. But Matthew Reese is the one who's delivering this performance that is really so very compelling as a reporter who's been tasked with interviewing Mr. Rogers. And he doesn't think that there's going to be anything interesting or unique here because he is so squeaky clean and he really is this person but on the screen and off screen mr rogers is this authentically nice human being and it ends up with mr rogers kind of becoming a mirror for this guy and this guy's issues and um he becomes a therapist he becomes a priest he becomes everything to this guy and i love the way that mariel heller played this uh it's just she's she's directed this thing with incredible daring that she doesn't get enough credit for because she's She's essentially uh, upended all of your expectations. You walk in thinking, okay, I'm going to watch Tom Hanks be Mr. Rogers, and you do, but he's not the he's not the focal point. She's also used these transitions and editing that are taking you into Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, and you've got uh, Mr. Rogers breaking the fourth wall to talk about the story that they're telling. And initially, it is very off-putting and very jarring to have that style, but then as you settle into it and, and you find that Matthew Reese and... And uh, Cooper, uh, oh my God, <laughs> Bra- um, not Bradley. I, no, not Bradley Cooper. <laughs> Jesus Christ! Oh my God! Yeah, from, we're both having a from moment Amer- here. American Million thing adaptation. Yeah, he's a genius. Chris Cooper, Chris, uh, the Academy Award winner. Uh, they have such an incredible uh, dynamic going on, and you know, he and his wife are incredible together. And just the the things that are happening in this movie, it's so daring and so bold and so. Not what you expect, that it really, at, by the end, it really won me over and had me uh, crying, honestly. I was so moved, so deeply moved by this movie. I had it at number 11, and like I said, The Irishman or probably The Joker could have come out for this one. Uh, I wanted The Irishman just because I figured that was my the only time we're going to get to talk about it. And Same with Joker. I knew it wouldn't be on your list, so it's, I don't know... It, it's just a weird year. <laughs> in so many ways. Uh, number five for me is The Lighthouse, and it's because it grew. Uh, when we talked about it on the show, it was like we both liked it a lot, but then we just kind of put it off to the side because it's its own kind of thing, too. How do you rank this movie? Uh, but I just had so much fun with it, uh, the whole T-shirt idea. Uh, <laughs> and the more I think about it, just the more fun this movie was. And n- Not only is it fun, it's in insanely artistic it's made as if it looks like a 1930s movie but it plays in 2019 willem dafoe's fantastic art pattinson's fantastic it is just a it's a neat little movie and when i came up to you know i did this all in that ranker app thing you gave me and when it was this or uncut gems i'm like i don't fucking know (laughs) and i at that moment it was the lighthouse but it could have been you know any other day it's uncut i don't know it's I just this movie's been growing on me more and more the more I talk about it, and I was kind of shocked that it ended up so high on my list. It's an honorable mention for me. It came yeah. close to being on the list as one of the last ones I left off, but it is really incredible. I, that final image is stunning, and uh, I, I have been taunting my my sister with uh, "Why did you spill your beans?" <laughs> over and over again. She has no idea what I'm talking about because she's not seen the movie, but it entertains me nonetheless. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it's a great Willem Dafoe performance. Yeah. Even with the farting. 
It, it just works because he, I mean, you can smell that lighthouse. <laughs> I know. I mean, it doesn't help that some theaters are so, most theaters are gross just seeing them. But uh, I, he just really did a good job of capturing everything and you could feel it. You could smell it. You could, I don't know. You yeah. Could, Anyway, what do you He's got? He's a hell for, of a director. What do you got for five? My number five is Marriage Story. Uh, Adam Driver, Scarlett Johansson, uh, directed by Noah Baumbach. Uh, so many just indelible moments. It's incredibly emotional, moving, uh, and and real. So very, very real. About a, a couple that is uh, seemingly perfect for each other, but uh, they're getting divorced. And the, uh, the life that they planned didn't work out. And now they've got to enter into this world of divorce that is an industry all its own that you know takes people in chews them up and spits them out on the other side and you're just trying to survive this thing happening and it's something that you just can't even begin to fathom because you you've known and loved this person for so long and now you're splitting up and you think well okay well it, we can make this work uh, we know each other well enough that we can work this out and uh, all will be well it's not going to be that easy. It's never going to be that easy, no matter how much you might care about somebody. And that's what this movie demonstrates uh, better than any mo- any other mo- movie I've ever seen on this topic. And leave it to Noah Baumbach to make his least cynical movie be, be about divorce. Right. <laughs> that's, just, that's that extra little spice that makes me love this movie so much more. Definitely an honorable mention on mine. Uh, the performances are just out of this world. I mean, they're, the chemistry they have is perfect then you bring in laura darn and the other i don't even remember the guys that are in alan alda and ray liotta, ray liotta. The, it, it just it the performances really make this movie even that much better on top of like what you said they i think the reason it fell off is one because i really wanted to talk about the irish <laughs> and two it didn't you know a lot of people. That was the thing about this movie. Everybody was like, "The marriage. You're going to watch this, and you're going to start. you going to start a fight, and you're going to get divorced." <laughs> and it didn't really apply to me. You know, I, I yeah. couldn't. If anything, I slightly related to Scarlett Johansson's character a little bit, but not even in like a personal way. Just kind of understanding her point of view. Right. And neither one's a villain. In right. Movie. And so it, it it didn't relate as much as I was thinking it would uh and so maybe uh, that's why it just is an honorable mention but it's fantastic it's on netflix it's i don't know adam driver had a hell of a year too i guess oh fuck yeah <laughs> he had an absolutely amazing so year. scarlett johansson yeah when you think matter. about it yeah she's on uh, i got her coming up again as soon. do i <laughs> uh number four is it mine yeah waves uh again waves are uncut gems wave or light i don't know it it was such a just a magical experience. Probably, like you said, one of the best scenes of the year, if not the best scene of the year. Uh, I mean, this guy, uh, Treadward Schultz, is gonna he's he's become one of the best directors out there. And you know, you, you just watch him step up movie to movie. Obviously, Lucretia is a little better than It Comes at Night, but that's because it was more indie and he had more control over it. But this is just uh, this is an epic movie and i hate using that word because it's overused but it really is a big scale movie and you just don't know what you're in for you just have no idea what you're getting into and I, again could have been number two I, it's it's fantastic i'll come back to it in a moment Got it. <laughs> my number four is uh jojo rabbit it's a uh, scarlett johansson once again take away td uh directing a story about a uh, young boy in nazi germany who's uh uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, his invisible friend, his uh, imaginary friend, imaginary friend is Hitler, uh, and the relationship between him and Hitler is completely hysterical from moment one. It's just so it is so transgressive the idea that this kid is playing with Hitler, and Hitler is his buddy who's encouraging him and and building him up and building his confidence and make you know trying to help him get over his fears and <laughs> it's just such a weird idea but that idea is only there for a part of the movie and that's it's really interesting because that's the that's the part that gets the most attention but uh there's really so much more interesting stuff happening here um uh, 
because Taika Waititi is a, an incredible director, he uses this comic stuff to like a great magic trick. He's you know, you're watching the one hand and he's doing something with the other hand, and that's uh, that other hand is coming in to punch you in the face. And when it hits, it is so much impact. And the artistry of it, the, the, the setup of it is so incredible because you should have seen it coming. You should have seen it coming. And then it lands and you're, oh, it, wow, what an incredible moment. It's still uh, the, the most impactful moment of the year for me. And it's just one visu- visible, visual. That's it. All it is is a visual. It's incredible. Just what a scene. This movie is incredible. Just this kid is great. He does such an amazing job uh, really carrying you through the film, becoming uh, more of a character throughout, becoming more of a human being throughout, uh, developing as a person. Just so many layers to this. It's just wonderful. It's my number three, uh, Jojo Rabbit. And like I said, when I you listen to that episode, we my kids went with me, and it registered with them, uh, too. So, I mean, it does... It, he, he He's such a good director. He could, he just is entertaining, and but like you said, because he's so entertaining, when that when that moment happens, it really does knock you on your ass. And it's I don't know. You don't even have time to bite your lip. Right, so tears just start falling. falling. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I'm torn for my two favorite supporting performances between Scarlett Johansson and Jennifer Lopez. Because of this moment, and there's a couple really small scenes that are just that make this moment that much more powerful. And then you got, you know, it's really hard for me to say which one I like better. And quite frankly, if either one of them won, I'd be happy, uh, even if I don't watch the awards. <laughs> or if I like them both to get nominated, but whatever. That'd be nice. Uh, but this just, this is such a good movie. It's so much fun, and it's so smart. Sam Rockwell's great. I don't know. The whole thing is just... Fucking <laughs> Sam Rockwell. Yes, he's amazing. <laughs> it, I, this was... Uh, again, it was... When I'm putting this up against Uncut Gems or Waves, it was hard, but I don't know. This just... For whatever reason, right, right now, I was feeling this was ahead of it. I don't know. I don't know why but well interestingly enough waves is my number three <laughs> so we flip flop <laughs> and again just Tr- trey edward schultz delivering the a- an incredible movie but also the best scene of the year and it's just a father talking to his daughter and just in a moment that uh i think everybody can relate to where it's the first time in your life an adult treats you like an adult and opens up to you in a way that you're probably not ready for but you have to be you don't have a choice but to be ready uh and that they capture he captures that i think better than i've ever seen captured on screen before that uh that breaking of the innocence for uh and the you know this this incredibly strong character played by sterling k brown who's just throughout he's been this force of not quite menace but certainly just sturdy manhood who does this is the guy who doesn't crack this is the guy who can't be broken he's and he's very you know he's very uh instructive toward his son you know almost to a point where of distance where he's more of a coach than he is a a father sometimes he's a friend more than a father and when he breaks down in that moment it has so much impact they set it up so brilliantly. And, of course, the movie at that point is also turning on its axis because we've been with one character to start the film, and now we're going to be joining up with this new character. Uh, not a new character, but this other character who's been there throughout but now is taking the center. And we're going to follow her story in a very unique and unexpected direction. It's such – and it's so deft. It's so – it works so brilliantly, and it's all about – a lot of it is about the visual uh, dynamic because Schultz directs this thing in such a unique way that he makes the opening visual and the closing visual match each other with this shot that you can't even figure out how he did it. <laughs> it's so great. Uh, I love this movie. Yeah, and I think I said on the episode that we talked about it, He, the way he films, you just feel like something bad is going to happen at all times. <laughs> uh, and that's... That is impressive because a lesser director would fuck that up. Yeah. And he never does. And similar to Hereditary, you know, the most impactful part of the movie in terms of, you know, what the fuck happens midway through. And then there's still another hour left. So it's, I I don't know, it's just a hell of a movie. Uh, I love it. And 
again. Could be number two even. <laughs> what do you got for our? That was my number three. Number so you're, three. it's your number two. I don't know. This is Lords of Chaos. It was number one for so long, and then Midsummer came out, and I keep going back to it. And one, I'm a rock metal guy, so that pulls for me. And two, they just they captured something that. It was really hard to capture a book that's widely panned by most of that that audience, and the movie for the most part was panned by them too. But it kind of has this, I don't know, to me, you know, like something like the Social Network on a lighter scale, or Citizen Kane on a lower, on a more indie scale. It, it, that ending scene is so, or the ending few scenes where Euronymous is starting to kind of grow up, and the other guys. Varg is getting more down the rabbit hole and it's just heartbreaking. It's, it's hard to watch. Uh, but at the same time, it's just, it's really powerful. And I don't know if it's the second best movie of the year. I'm just, I'm holding on to it, but I mean, it's definitely in the top 30. Uh, but I don't know. It just really landed for me. And I don't know. I had a hard time picking against it. It's a, it's an honorable mention for me. I uh, dropped off my top ten, but uh, I, I I love it. I, I think it captures better than I ever could have imagined. It captures the absolute crazy absurdity of this story, which has been told uh, numerous times on the uh, true crime podcast circuit because it is such a a bizarre series of crimes. You have these very unique. Uh, characters involved. The character of Dead is one of the more weird and fascinating characters ever. And uh, just watching the way that character is portrayed and, and his how his story ends and affects the rest of the story. And then you've got uh, Kieran Culkin delivering an incredible performance uh, here that is so funny and absurd and outsized and yet also like at the end it's so tragic. You You do sense this guy He's maybe left behind these childish things and is looking forward to an actual life. And then this other thing happens and you're like, what the fuck? It's just so disgusting and tragic. Yeah. And I mean, I've read the book. I've listened to all the interviews and, you know, you know what happens to dead. But until when you see it, it's just so much. I don't know. You know what's coming and it's still just hard to watch. And I don't know. It I, this movie has such a, I mean, and I don't think it gets enough credit. I think most critics have kind of turned on it, which is unfortunate, but it is, it's playing with such a, uh, it's got such a small way of, of succeeding and that it does is so impressive because it is playing with a story that is utterly absurd, darkly comic, and yet has to make a turn at a certain point where it's going to compel you to buy into the tragedy at the end. And that's really, it is such a needle thread that they pull off here to capture the tone. And that's what really sold me on it. But at the same time, you know, you got, you know, the metal audience is a lot like the Star Wars or the wrestling audience where they just hate everything. And uh, this movie isn't loved by a lot of those people uh, because they didn't do everything perfect. And (laughs) uh, whatever, it works for me. They also don't see their own absurdity. Right. (laughs) What do you got for two? Whatever two is Uncut Gems. Uh, And I got to say, I mean, it's the best performance of the year. It's the by far the best performance of Adam Sandler's career. Even I can't deny it. Uh, and he is my nemesis, other than Gerard Butler. And uh, it's just, he's so incredible. It's just, he's an action movie in human form. He you forget just, you're watching Adam Sandler. Yeah, it, he's just, it's such a lived-in performance as Howard, this uh, diamond dealer who's uh, trying to obtain this uncut gem from Africa. He's got it. He's going to sell it. But, of course, he can't get out of his own way. He keeps tripping over himself trying to find the next big rush that he can get in his life. And that's all his life is, is a series of various different rushes that he can capture in just for a moment. And Sandler is just so perfect at at, at bringing this energy and this life to this role Um Oddly, I heard somebody on another podcast compare it to his role in Happy Gilmore. Just the, which I, I can I can see it. I don't like that movie. I can see what you're. I can see what they're saying because there is so much energy and so much anger and so much just life happening all at once. This guy is so relentless, as you said earlier. 
And uh, just the direction by the Safdie brothers is incredible. The music, the 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 score is sensational. It, the way it captures his mood and seems to rise and fall with him at every moment. Kevin Garnett, <laughs> wow, <laughs> right? That is incredible. The way that he he's such an, an urgent part of this and kind of has the same mentality as Howard on a much uh, on a much more muted scale. He's very much he's got a similar sort of obsession, and you can sense the way that he buys into Howard and having as the kind of a kinship going on there. And I, I really I really loved that. Well, there's a lot of the actors aren't even real actors. Like some of the mob guys are like real mob guys. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and like I guess I've heard things in the interviews where like you don't really punch at him, Adam. You just pretend. To, you're like, well, how am I going to pretend to punch him? Like, I, <laughs> and I don't know that ending. My God, what I think Ugh. hurts it for me, and it's not even fair. It's that I've been wanting to see this for like probably a solid three months. Yeah, and so and I'm prepared for it. And so I I didn't get that moment like what waves gives me or whatever. It it was just I, I was just too prepared for, which is weird to say for a movie like this cuz it, it is relentless and it is fantastic and they're two of the better directors out there. Uh A24 another banner year. Uh, I love Uncut Gems. I... <laughs> wait a minute. Is my number... Wait. <laughs> this is three, two, three, two, and one. All like two, four movies. My top six, four of them. <laughs> wow. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. And of course, we agree on number one. Yeah, it's Midsummer. <laughs> I, it's almost so transcendent that I, it belongs on a different list. Mm-hmm. Like, that's how great Midsummer is. Uh, uh I mean, I just Ari Aster is he's he's my he's my guy, he's my man, that's my filmmaker. I just I watch Midsummer, I've seen it five times now, and I just I marvel at it every single time. The bold choices, the daring bits of direction, the the clever choices of the actors involved. Uh, Florence Pugh's incredibly incredibly strong performance. She's, she's selling so many of these moments that uh, I think a lot of people might have struggled with. Yeah, I'm with you 100%. Florence Pugh's amazing. She is just... Uh, the, I can't even... Uh, just the, the moments, the, the her face, the racked with tears moments that she has in this movie early on. You, it's just so real and it's so raw. And just throughout, you know, she she has this insane trauma happen to her, and then she's got to go on. And I mean, this is the kind of trauma that people end movies with, you know. And she's starting the movie from this place of having been just deathly traumatized, like a kind of trauma that sends people to mental hospitals, is what she goes through. And then she's got a she's dealing with also this relationship that is. E- ending before her eyes even though she refuses to admit it mm-hmm. and jack rayner you know is basically d- just the obligated boyfriend like oh crap this thing happened to her i certainly can't break up with her now <laughs> you know and, and that energy taking you to sweden in that moment is like wow this is a really fucked up situation and it only gets more fucked up from there and it just keeps building and building these blocks on top of blocks of just this new tension and shocks that are there are inserted into this movie and perfectly calibrated it is i mean just the way he he sets up the shocks are just absolutely perfect and it's this big breath and then it's calm again and then for a moment and then it's amping up again and it's going to explode again in this big thing amazing movie yeah i kind of blame midsummer for a lot of the you know the frustration with the the IPs, the, you know, I, I the, it was a long time. It really wasn't until Once Upon a Time in Hollywood that, and it was only because Tarantino is so Tarantino, you know, it's uh, almost not even a movie, uh, that it just, it makes other movies not fun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if that, it's that it, it's good. Like, yeah, it's like being served microwave food all year, then you get a five-star meal, and then you're back to microwave food for the rest of the year. Right, and then occasionally you get to go out for dinner and you get these other movies that are great, you know. Uh, but 
on top of that, the way it was marketed was so good. I didn't know what the fuck it was about. Yeah. I knew it was a horror movie because Ari Aster, but I didn't know anything more than that. So I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Uh, there, you know, they've made her. I mean, she was going to be a star whether she did this movie or not because of everything else she did this year. But Florence Pugh was just, just you know, the whole ending, the the level of emotion she goes through. That look that wow. she ends the movie on is yeah. haunting. Uh, I, the whole thing is, I mean, it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's fucked up. It's weird. It's, but it's never for the sake of anything other than the story. You yeah. Know? It all serves. Yeah. And when you walk, I mean, a few movies do that where you just walk that fine line of, you know, being weird but having it matter and having everything tightly fit together and just I don't know it, it's a full blown masterpiece and I I'm not sure what the next movie I'm going to see is that's going to be better than it <laughs> like I I it's already my second favorite movie of all time like it's behind right behind Lebowski is the greatest thing I've ever seen in at the movies <laughs> that's what I, that's where it's at for me. Uh, I just, I walked out of this movie, just changed. This movie acted upon me. I was walking in my car, just muttering to myself about what I'd just seen and just kind of trying to come to terms with the, the imagery and the, and just how, uh, how affecting it is. I do feel like, you know, this is one of those examples where, I mean, it's still good on TV, but when you see it on that big screen, it matters that there's a big difference, uh, I mean, it is hypnotizing. It is intoxicating, like literally intoxicating. Yeah. Uh, that screen just doesn't stop. Like there's something going on at all times. It is, and, yeah. It's an overload, a visual overload. Because there, I mean, if you watch the walls, you can see you can see the entire story played out in pictures on the walls, right off the bat. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, people have seen it on on. My brother watched it. You know on demand or whatever and he was like it's a dark comedy i'm like it's more than a dark comedy uh you know those scenes you're referring to weren't funny you know when you saw it in the theater yeah. they're funny they if you laugh it's because you're uncomfortable you know especially that sex the orgy oh, yeah. that's not that's not funny it is uncomfortably awkward and that's why you have the reaction you have and it's i don't know the guy's a master and you know i'm trying to do my decade list and like the top four movies are like Fincher and Astor. <laughs> kind of messed up. At least as of now, I don't know if that'll change or not, but it's, I don't know. I don't, I feel like sometimes we're on our own with this movie. I mean, there are others. It kind of feels like it, does it? Uh, but it really. Because I, I was pushing this, uh, uh, I'm pushing this right now with the uh, Iowa film critics that I'm a member of, and I pushed it with the uh, broadcast film critics and got nowhere, nothing. Other than I think uh, best horror nomination, which is you know certainly that, but it's more than that. Way more too. than that. You can't you can't ghettoize this movie. Yeah, I, and it's it's a shame. Uh, but I'm sure you guys were all shocked at. Uh, <laughs> uh, what else did you want to talk? Other movies that you want to? I just got it. Like I said, the fair like the lighthouse is on my on my honorable mention list. It's on yours. Lords of Chaos is on my honorable mentions. I just want to say that you know, Florence Pugh just had an amazing year, and she's leading this uh, group of incredible young actresses that are coming up. You know, there's her, but there's also uh, Jessica Roth, who was in Happy Death Day to You this year, which was uh, far better than it had any right to be. Uh, Jesse Buckley had two incredible performances this year in Wild Rose and in Judy. And uh, Ready or Not is a movie that stayed with me for a very long time with uh, Samara Weaving. That's a really great horror movie that a lot of people missed out on. But, uh, you know, I would mention The Farewell, Aquafina. Hopefully she gets a Best Actress nomination. That's a great movie. Captain Marvel's the one true blockbuster this year that I really loved. I still stays with me, even though I keep forgetting that it actually came out this year. Yeah, I'll be <laughs> honest. That's probably the first movie we talked about that I didn't like. <laughs> uh, Parasite. Uh, Which I haven't seen. Uh, an incredible fucking movie. Uh, just really, really awesome. Uh, John Wick, uh, another blockbuster, but uh, you know, its own kind of blockbuster. Uh, Booksmart, 
Yeah. Maybe the, one of the funniest movies of the year. Rocket Man, Peter Butter Falcon. Uh, I mean, no no actor had a better year. Maybe other than Shia. Adam Driver, Shia LaBeouf is right there with him. Um, let's see, Ad Astra. I loved Ad Astra. I just watched that uh, this week, and it. I mean, it was on my honorable mention list. Uh, I. It captures what scares me about space. You know, that's to me the ocean and space are the two scariest. And I know that's. Uh, you know, it's a cliche with Jaws and Alien, but right. you know what made Josh kind of not like this movie is what it captured. Why you know I movies like Interstellar are pieces of shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ford versus Ferrari. Yeah. Uh, That's classic, my favorite blockbuster of the year. Yeah, classic Hollywood movie. Wonderful film. Uh, Knives Out. Ryan Johnson did Tons a great job with that movie. The Two Popes is on Netflix now and worth watching. Two great performances And we may there. talk about that next week with a pretty light week. We'll yeah. see. Uh, Bombshell. I loved Bombshell. Uh, I think it's one of the better movies of the year. Uh, Portrait of a Lady on Fire is a movie that people need to see. It's a French film about uh, two women who have a have an affair. Uh, and uh, I'll leave it at that. It's, uh, it's just fantastic. In uh, 1917 is on my list as well as an honorable mention. I had Motherless Brooklyn, uh, similar to Irishman and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It's uh, it's kind of a comfort food kind of thing. It's a throwback to like uh, Chinatown, I guess. Yeah. Uh, really good, really good actors, but not, again, probably if you're doing 30 movies, that might be 30, 31. Uh, but I think it's really good and people will like it. It's just, I am encouraged by a lot of the original ideas this, that came out this year, which made it putting Irishman and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood hard on here because that, that's the what I already know. That's the two things that you know that I'm familiar with. It's Scorsese style and the Tarantino style. Otherwise, every, everybody else really did something cool and original, a new feel, and that's encouraging. And mm-hmm. I, I gotta know. I gotta throw a shout out uh, to something that people probably will be find. Unusual, but there there's a new uh, B movie horror uh, label out there that's turning out some of the best uh, drive-in movies you could imagine uh, that they don't make anymore. Very low budget horror. Epic Pictures put out movies this year. Arctic Arctic about a serial killer, which is a <laughs> really uh, exciting, messed up movie. Uh, Dry Blood is another one. It's a, just a a guy in a house and a ghost, uh, and one of the more uh, one of the better horror visuals of the year of just this little girl and suddenly her head just falls off and rolls toward you. <laughs> it's really, it's really, I mean, the movie's only okay, but that, that is a pretty great visual. Uh, hoax is about Bigfoot and, uh, is a group. It's, it's bad in many ways, but it's also very entertaining in the way that it's bad. Book of Monsters is a really underrated film. Uh, three really great, uh, lead, Actress performances. Uh, it combines all of the great, like uh, uh, monsters of myth, into one story, and uh, on a very low budget, brings them to life in a way that's very unexpected and very uh, shocking and exciting. I really like Book of Monsters a lot. Actually, a really strong honorable mention for me. And uh, Black Sight is a, a sci-fi movie, the kind of sci-fi movie that uh, you know hasn't been made since the 1970s. Uh, I, you, if you haven't heard of Epic Pictures, they're under the uh, Dread Central banner, and uh, definitely worth checking out their stuff. That's very cool. Yeah, my brother's movie was picked up by another company, and they renamed it. It's a Wonderful Slice. <laughs> Change the credits and everything. Uh, but it's still a Cadaver Christmas is on Prime. Right. It's a Wonderful Slice it's on Amazon. you got to buy it. It's weird. <laughs> uh, it's what, a Wonderful what? Slice. <laughs> so stupid. My brother was pissed. Uh, <laughs> what was your most? I don't want to say hated because I hate the strong, but di- what disappointed you the most? Like, oh, Zombie Land Double Tap. I mean, you remember that episode? I just, I'm so, uh, I hate that movie so much, and I just they took something that I loved and just destroyed it. That one really stands out. As, glass. Uh, glass was bad. Yeah, Glass is on there too. Glass almost like I don't know. To me, the Zombie Land movies are just kind of. 
throwaway fun action movies. And even the second one, obviously, was a lesser, but it didn't bother me as much. But Unbreakable is fucking awesome. Split was almost as good. And then Glass just shit all over both those and ruined them. Absolutely. Him. Yeah, that, uh, <laughs> that is definitely a movie that makes me angry. And then The Dead Don't Die really bummed me out. I wanted yeah. that to be so good. And just old man yells at Cloud. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, Shaft. How shitty was Shaft? Just taking one of the the great characters of all time and just turning him, just aging him out like he's like he's now in his eighties, like he's just the oldest person on the planet now. Ugh, just awful. The kitchen was terrible. Of course, Angel has fallen was awful. That's to be expected. Well, yeah. Hellboy, uh, just a real piece of crap. Uh, the Dirt, the Motley <laughs> Crew movie, hard to watch. It's so bad. No, I wasn't that bad. And Cats, of course, is the one that uh, everybody's talking about right now, which is uh, on many worst of the year list, and deservedly so. One that's d- not getting enough bad movie attention, though, uh, I think is Men in Black International. <laughs> that movie was really terrible. And don't don't sleep on Replicas. Uh, Keanu Reeves, worst performance ever. Even worse than Chain Reaction. You haven't seen Knock Knock yet. <laughs> I'm telling you, see that movie and then tell me what's worse than that. <laughs> Sounds like he's gonna have a great year next year, though. Is like Matrix and uh, the new John Wick are coming out on like the same day. Or That's something weird, like that. right? That's got to so change, strange. right? I would think so. Uh, t- returning to good things for a moment, documentaries. Uh, be sure to check out Screwball about the uh, steroids and a- Alex Rodriguez, directed by the guy who did Cocaine Cowboys. Instant Dreams is a is a wonderfully strange documentary about uh, Polaroid and the death of the Polaroid camera and the dwindling supply of uh, film for Polaroid cameras. And uh, really fascinating and extraordinarily well made. And Life After Flash is one of the most entertaining documentaries I've ever seen. You can't really I can't defend the artistry of it, but uh, <clears throat> in terms of just being a an entertaining documentary that about a really silly movie, uh, Life After Flash is pretty great. And I mean, I'll I'll throw out the Game Changers as a documentary. It's on Netflix now. Uh, obviously, it's a plant based uh, documentary, but I mean, it's gotten a lot of buzz. And uh, Joe Rogan had a bunch of people on to, or one guy on, and they tried to debunk the whole thing. And then they brought the director on, and he buried them. It was amazing to watch. <laughs> To the point where Rogan was like, yeah, okay, you're right. But at the same, I mean, again, there's a different argument to be had as well. Uh, but it, it's worth watching, especially if you need some motivation to start the new year off on your diet. And that's what I'm going to watch again to hopefully get going. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that. I forgot one of my honorable mentions, and it reminded me of that. Is uh, Probably because it's too raw and too personal, but uh, you know, if you listen to our Britney Runs a Marathon episode, yeah. I think you know where that, where that comes from. I find it. I find it hard to place that movie on my best of the year list because I'm too, I'm too in it. It's too raw for me. Uh, I feel that movie on a, on a different level. Right. And then the Lords of chaos, I feel like I put it as high as I did because I was so in it. Uh, I don't know. Again, this list could change every day of yeah. the week for me, at <laughs> least midsummer is still going to be at the top, but, um, I don't know. Uh, anything else before you move on to 1989? No, I got nothing. Uh, not a whole lot. Always Steven Spielberg movie. Yeah, really kind of that dreary, dull, nostalgic uh, Spielberg that's easy to forget about. Yeah, watchable though. Yeah. The Spielberg's always watchable though. Yeah. Professional, uh, you know, well-made, whatever. Right. <laughs> <laughs> then the Puppet Master. <laughs> Is this the horror movies? Yeah, the first one. Wow. Hard to believe, huh? Yeah, I never got into that. And they never, I mean, they made a million sequels, but I don't remember. They never, they never were talked about like Chucky was or, you know, I I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised, though, if they they one day did get picked up and remade by somebody and they haven't already pretended like it was a big deal. Because that's basically how Chucky worked. Is like, (laughs) nobody. Well, Chucky, full, well, Chucky, Jason, and Freddy went full blown comedy, and that's you know, what's her name, Jennifer Tilly, got a another run for five to ten years out of that. Uh, next week we got The Grudge, uh, 
1990, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, one of the more terrifying horror movies I've ever seen. And then our classic is going to be Zodiac because we're going to talk about serial killers. We might as well. <laughs> Why not, right? Uh, for you know, obviously, if we were doing top 89 movies, I mean, it's it was a bad year, 89. Yeah. But, you know, Dead Poet Society, Batman, Do the Right Thing, uh, When Harry Met Sally, Field of Dreams, and Say Anything. There you go. That's mine. Yeah. <laughs> and Sex, Lies, and Videotape. With, you know, uh, the Spike Lee one way ahead of all of them. Pretty much. <laughs> it, it's the midsummer of that year. It's just, he's looking back at everybody. <laughs> uh, anything else before we wrap it up? No, nope, that's all I got. All right. Well, that was 2019. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, uh, let's thank our Patreon supporters real quick before we wrap it up. On our key grip level, we got Charlie Messing and Jason Bryant at our craft services level. Zach Kovmaker at our character actor level. Josh and Beth Paul. Cousin Jeff and Christina Cato. And then our special effects level, Corey Finner and Sarah Morale. If you want to be a Patreon supporter, I hate critics that not slash Patreon. Best way to help us out. And look for our new merch in 2020. Uh, I'm expecting it to be a lot of fun. Uh, hopefully it all works out. Uh, flick chart, or do you want to go? I mean, I can. I, th- I think I got to correct whatever it is you guys did to it last week. Did you I listen to it at all? I did not. What did you guys do to me? I don't even remember. <laughs> I left last week because I had to run for whatever reason. I left... Uh, Zach and Josh here to screw up our list. Probably voting up Lord of the Rings or some garbage. Oddly enough, <laughs> remember you remember the name of Zach's cat? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the whatever Speed Two Cruise Control or Penelope yeah. Cruise Control. Yeah. Speed Two Cruise Control popped up like three times. <laughs> so that was the only memorable thing I can remember from, and it didn't win any of them. By the wow. way. <laughs> Major pain, the town. The town. Let's see. What is next? The Fox and the Hound, 1981. The Chronicles of Narnia, Prince Caspian. (laughs) Fox and the Hound. Blade, 1998. The Shining. The Shining. Dr. Sleep was an okay horror movie. Nobody saw it. Yeah. uh, But it was a pretty solid. I would say the blockbuster horrors was my favorite. Better than it. Oh yeah, better, way better. Than Another it. disappointing movie. Hugely disappointing. Yeah. I still know what you did last summer. Gross Point Blank. Gross Point Blank. Point Break ninety one Excalibur. <laughs> it's Point Break for me, but I know that's making a lot of people angry because they like Excalibur for some reason. Point Break's fun though. Some like it hot. The Professional. Some like it hot. I like The Professional. You have the quarter. You flip it. <laughs> Heads. Some like it hot. Thought maybe if you flipped it, I'd win every time. <laughs> the Chronicles of Riddick, Rocky Four. The Chronicles of Riddick for me. Go ahead and flip it. <laughs> that was awesome. Tails. Wow. I wouldn't have been that upset if Rocky Four lost. Charlotte's Web, Thelma and Louise. Thelma and Louise. This is 90s a year of Dances with Wolves versus Goodfellas, right? That sounds right. I can't wait. <laughs> Jeepers Creepers, King Solomon's Mines. King Solomon's Mines. Really? Yeah, absolutely. I don't even know what that is. I'll let you go with that one. Jeepers Creepers isn't very good. Justin Long likes it a lot. <laughs> He's in it. The Lion King, Stark, 93. I don't know what Stark is. Yeah, I don't is. know that either. The Lion King, the cartoon, Diamonds Are Forever. Whew. Uh, I guess I'll slightly go Lion King. You're not as big into the Lion King as most people are. It's true. It's Uncle Uncle Jeff has he has his movie thing he does too, and he had this one versus the You were one of the few people that liked the new one better, right? Yeah. Josh does not. <laughs> Ghost World, 
Texas Chainsaw Massacre, 74. Oh, it's Texas Chainsaw Massacre. As much as I love Ghost World. Yeah. Ghost World is wonderful, but it's no Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That was Massacre. back when Scarlett Johansson was Florence Pugh. And <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> next year, they get to be in a movie together. Next year, Florence Pugh becomes a star. It's not yeah. just a breakout. It's full-blown star. Gods of Egypt, K-Pax. <laughs> All right, good night, everybody.